we started entering competitions in the UK and that's mm -hmm. what we did. And the good news is from doing that, for the last four years, we've now won 14 Great Taste Awards. One of the things that we did have from the very beginning, we've always been a progressive company. Mm -hmm. We have certain values that are important to us that we will not sacrifice. The problems of roasting coffee are far more can we get the coffee to Barbados? There's all the okay. logistics in part. It's the packaging. It's how do we make labels? It's everything else that you could think of. Have you ever had the opportunity to have a coffee to cure your cold? Good afternoon. Welcome to the hey. first episode of the Caribbean Coffee Collective podcast. Today we have the honorable guest, Dominic Wyndham Giddens from Wyndham's Bayesian Coffee Roasters out of Barbados. Hi, Dominic. Hi, Aaron. How are you doing? Thank you. It's, very, it's an honor to be on. And I to be, to be considered the first. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very excited. Appreciate I've been Excellent. following you for a while and uh, looking forward to having your story shared amongst the, the coffee community across the Caribbean and, and across the globe, hopefully. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah. So, um, Dominic, I would like you to kind of paint a picture of Wyndham. Um, back to when you kind of first envisioned it happening. Envision is the wrong word to say. It was more of um, a sink or swim kind of situation. I needed a okay. job. And as a failed punk rocker, there wasn't many punk rock jobs available in Barbados. So, and I needed a job. And it was fortuitous that I met my girlfriend then, now my, now my wife of 23 years at co-founder and she's my boss so we've stuck around for a long time it was just something that we needed i needed something to do and by pure chance my family had an old espresso machine in a warehouse and i had a client who needed an espresso machine and so i lagged my way through my first equipment sale and from there 25 it's now 26 years later we're still here. So I've done pretty good for myself, I think. Oh, wow. So did you just had the random espresso machine? Somebody you did. did it, it was, you exactly. fixed it all up it's, and brought it to them. I fixed it all up. And this is the day before we had, we had, we didn't have email at the time. So I had to do it via fax with Italy. And let me tell you, those were some very expensive lessons, but you know, it, it came about, I, but from there, yeah, for a first sale, first bit of information, and then we just grew and grew and grew, stalled a couple of times because, you know, we had a world financial crisis and we had a pandemic. But I would say it's not, this is now my 26th year as a coffee professional. So that's pretty good. Okay. So but, but, uh, I'm curious, though, when was that moment that you kind of discovered that, that you enjoyed coffee? Or was it the business of coffee that you enjoyed? Um, can you take us back to that? I guess the, the moment that I, to be honest, I think the moment that it kicked in was the moment that we decided to roast our own coffee. That's when okay. it became, that's when it became the most scary, but that's when it became the, <clears throat> edit all that crap out. It was the moment we decided to, the moment we decided to, decided to roast our own coffee. That's when okay. I got the most excited. But it's also what the, when I got the most scared. Because instead of being a distributor for a product and you're, you're selling someone else's coffee, I decided to put my own name on my own product. And I will tell you, not many people were very enthusiastic about the idea. Why would you take this business where you're importing espresso from, you know, a traditional Italian espresso where people, and you've spent close to 10, 12 years building up the market for that. Why would you all of a right. sudden want to then change? And I will say as a Caribbean person, we're not known, we're very conservative in that way. We're very fearful. So to do something that risky I would say there was one other person who agreed with me in doing that, and that was my wife, Mandy, and co-founder. We're the only okay. ones who believed in ourselves. So that was, the, that was the best moment. I would say from there, 
the fact that we've learned and we've been able to excel at it, that's what gets keeps me going every day. That I'm we're, okay. that I'm challenging the status quo of what's available in Barbados, and we're able to do things our way versus what's dictated and at the whims of some, you know, a multinational corporation. Right. So w- w- when did you actually get into the roasting process? So I, I envision you fix this machine, you start to fall in love with the. The whole thing. Yeah. Like, so, when does the so roastery we, so, idea come so the ro- So we've been. So my, our company started clearly as an import business for uh, Italian espresso. We brought it in, brought in, you know, shipped it in all the time. Service hotels and restaurants, cafes. Okay. We taught a lot of people about what Italian espresso was, and okay. so we had the equipment that would go with it. So that's that was probably the first twelve years. So it played around two thousand and twelve. But what happened was in the financial crisis of two thousand and eight, a lot of we had we had to lose business because people could no longer afford to buy our coffee because it's expensive okay. because of import duties among other things. So it was, it was then that we started we started to look at we're beholden to someone, and right. so through some. And that is where that's probably the scariest thing to ever be when you're a small company, when you're beholden to, to the whims of a financial situation, but you're beholden mm-hmm. to the whims of a financial of, of a large corporation. And uh, that is when we decided to say, look at it. The ro- we started roasting coffee. We bought our roaster in 2012. So after four years of research, in 2012, we bought our roaster and then we've spent the last, yeah, so it's now been close to eight years. Oh, yeah, 2014 is like 2014 is when we broke in 2013. It took about six months or whatever. And by 2014, we had the first product on the shelves. And that was very exciting okay. for us for sure. Yeah. yeah. All self taught? No, definitely you... not. We, so we've, so we've, we definitely not self taught. So we, I, we, the one cool thing about, the coffee industry is if you're if you're open to it, you meet a lot of cool people. And I would definitely mm-hmm. say purely because of the fact that I had the connections with Ranchilio and I mm. travel to the SEA conferences, you meet a lot you meet some good people. And so yeah. when you have a question, the coolest thing about our mark our about coffee is that you can meet people who are very willing to share their information. So I was able to l- well, through my contacts, I was able to link up with Philip Hand of Groundwork Coffee in LA. And mm-hmm. Philip's, we had a couple of conversations, told him what I wanted to do. And he said, sure. And he came down. We met. We bought all the right equipment through his help. He came down and we then started roasting together. And so a crash course of coffee in two weeks. And I've been learning ever since. <laughs> That's the one okay. thing you don't stop. You don't stop learning when you roast when you roast coffee for a living. Yeah, that's one of the best parts of it. Uh, I myself, as a roaster too, is the different challenges. Um, so I initially that's, converted those, my garage. Those are, that was interesting. That's the interesting part about it. But it's actually yeah. the. It's never never easy, especially when you're coming from a low Caribbean island. There's always a challenge yeah. or a challenge too many when you live in a low Caribbean island. Yeah. So I was thinking like um, that I have several questions, right? So sure. I converted my garage initially into the roastery. So half of my garage punched a hole through the roof, uh, fell through right. the ceiling, actually, all those fun stuff. But the challenge oh. of the different weathers, like so out of Texas, um, where I had my roastery, it could be 100 degrees one yes. time of the year or 30 mm-hmm. degrees. And I still had customers demand and had to learn to roast in those different temperatures. Is it challenging to roast with the, the weather um, where you're at? Our, our, I would definitely say Barbados because it's a very temperate climate and we have a we have a solid sun year all year round. So we do not have the shifts in temperatures that you would definitely experience. Okay. Our our problems of roasting coffee are far more. Can we get the coffee to Barbados? It's all the okay. logistics and plan. It's the packaging. It's how do we make labels? It's everything else that you could think of where you don't have the ability to just push a button and order. If you order something, it can be there within days. If I order something, it can take up to six months. 
And so those are the challenges that you're dealing with. And so, you know, when you want samples, you get this again, they get sent to you relatively easy. I want samples, I have to pay for FedEx. And I'm those are all these so there are all these act added cost of time and money that make it every day a new challenge. But mm. what I would say is because of that, I've learned to be very well rounded in every aspect of the business. So where I, some people yeah. are just roasters, I am the roaster or I was the roaster technically. I am the director of coffee. I handle business development. I can tear down an espresso machine and rebuild it in two hours. I can, I've learned how to fix super automatic espresso machines. I now run a printing press. I design labels. We do social media. So we are, we do everything in the company now. So yeah. that makes me a very, I'm the go-to guy in the company because I also know every client by name. I know every coffee machine I've sold. And I've now sold over 500 commercial espresso machines. I still know them all. And so okay. it's, that's, those are the areas that I excel in. I'm, I'm the guy who knows everything. Or I'm the guy who they come for backdoor anecdotal information to always help. So yeah, that yeah. makes it fun. That's you, the fun part you, to me. You say that. So is there like something though that uh, you're like, this is my home. Uh, this is where I'd want to be in, in the business where I feel the the most comfortable or you just enjoy all of it? It's, I, 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 as the owner of the company, I have to make it work. No one's going to care as much as I do. So I have to make sure yeah. it works. So that way we have a good team, but ultimately I can never, I able to delegate or we're able to delegate to different people, which is the great part, but oh, I'll always have to be involved in everything because I'm the one with the, let's just say the most anecdotal knowledge. I know where everything is and as the owner of the company, the buck stops with me. So I need to make sure everything, every, I have to always be in, in tune with what's going on with the company. Got it. And um, so you open the roastery and then some cafes follow from that? No, that's, that's the thing. So you open, we, so we started roasting coffee purely because I fell in love. We, were, I, we started roasting coffee because the reality was, was that my palate got bored. Italian espresso, and I have a lot of respect for Italian espresso, especially traditional espresso, because there's a reason for it. Italian espresso is, is not always about the product. It's about the mm -hmm. feeling. It's about the emotion that goes with it. Yeah. And that's why I love it. I would say you must give Italian espresso its due, because it's still, it's still the benchmark in terms of what you want, in terms of customer loyalty in a way. People say yeah. so they think of Italy. So that's great. Yeah. But because of historical dogma, of dogma, Italian espresso has to be a particular way. It has to have certain mm -hmm. ingredients. It has to be roasted in a particular way. And that's fine and good, but it's very boring. And that's just the mm. truth. And by pure chance, the world is changing. Specialty coffee in the United States was obviously, and it's still... In its early days, or when I say early days, the ability to have really good specialty coffee was still in its early days. And we were in New York City, and I had my first single origin espresso. It was an Ethiopia natural process. It was a it was a fruit bomb, yeah. but it, it blew a hole in my brain. And I said, yeah. "What is this?" And from that moment on, I couldn't I couldn't stop. I said, I have to, I have to do this. And, and that was things when Mandy and I were discussing it, what do we do? Do we just start importing this? And it was Mandy who said, no, let's do it ourselves. And so that's what yeah. led on to us doing Guara coffee. So that last, that, that lasting impression of what coffee can taste like, natural mm -hmm. process, Ethiopian. That's why to this day, I still drink Ethiopian coffees daily. It is actually my go-to espresso or my go-to okay. um, single origin anytime. I love natural process Ethiopians. Yeah. The same experience with me. I walked into a coffee shop in New York and Brooklyn about 2005, and I drank a coffee from Kenya, I remember. Right. And it was just something I've never experienced ever in my whole life. That cleanliness. Like, how, that, how could this, like, this yeah. drink have so much uh, be so dynamic? 
Yes, and exactly. transformative. And then you, yeah. you just you hang out at the shops for a while and you start watching all the people come and go, the smells, yeah. new varieties come in. Yeah, it, it addicted me, you know, called to me too. Um, Immediately. It's one of those things. It, it, you have, a, you have a, a come to Jesus moment, as they say, not for me, but it was just come to coffee moment. It's just like, I can't do anything else. And that's what I have to do. And then at the same time, it's also, there's the romantic side of it, but then there's also the understanding of it. We, we did it because it was a financial reason. It was, we, ha we had to start producing. We, we didn't want to be, be beholden to someone anymore. Yeah. Because, and that's why we started. We thought, okay, we can do this ourselves. And luckily for Phil, Phil made me think it was going to be easy. If he told if I really knew how hard it was, we definitely would not have done it. Because like, that's the thing. It's like when we started roasting, it's like I thought the roaster did the work. You know? Oh yeah. I yeah. that's that's because that's what that's where every every person I talk talk to, yeah, you know, you do, you just follow the roast curve, you follow the Maillard reaction. You know, it has a timer. Great, fantastic. It was only when I realized my palate had to change. Did it mm. really? Did and that, that scared me because technically my palate was very basic. I only yeah. knew what coffee was i didn't know what yeah. coffee could be and i will definitely say it took years several a good four years before i finally felt confident enough in saying oh i now understand i've always known what flavors are because it, that's the coolest thing about the caribbean though because in the caribbean you have access to so many diverse flavors that maybe mm. others don't so when i say when when a person's a natural processed coffee comes your way and you taste a fruit bomb and some people would be like, ew, that's terrible. I tasted that and went, well, this tastes like cherry juice or this tastes like mm. mango juice or maybe there's yeah. some tropical fruit that I can reference it to. So my brain didn't re reject it immediately. That's why I loved it so much. I'm like, this is mm. different. And the fact that because I also come from, as from the Caribbean, we have so many spices available to us. My palate, as in food, was very susceptible and open. But once yeah. I was able to, and once I was able to get my brain to understand, liquid is food or coffee is food. Yeah, it's not a drink. That's when that was the aha moment to me. It's like, mm. oh, it's it's food. It's it's cooking. It's flavors, yeah. it's tasting, it's crafting a meal. And that's like one of the first things I know share with people. It's like, look, don't think of coffee as a drink. Think of it as we're chefs. We are chefs of yeah. coffee. We're taking a raw product and we're adding heat and time to bring out the best flavors of it intrinsic inside the actual coffee itself. Yeah. We're just yeah. So just like what a chef does. And, that's what, and then I feel a lot of people get it then. Oh, right. it's not this static thing where it must taste like chocolate and nut or bitter. It doesn't have to be like that. It can be all these other things. And so when I look at my our coffee offering, we don't serve coffees in that sense. We have mm -hmm. we have offerings for you to broaden your taste palette. And they're all, all right. going to be amazing. They're all going to be picked specifically for a reason. Because we want you to broaden, be able to broaden yourself, but at the same time, they're there to provide you that, to take you on that journey. Where if you want to start off with the classic dark roast, great. But we're, we can mm -hmm. take you on that journey and open up your palate bit by bit. And we're going to give you the information and the confidence to try new things and not feel like a fool. That's the one thing that I'm very... I very much want to make sure people know is that there's no snobbery here for me because I've met too many coffee snobs. And mm -hmm. there, I think there's some of the reasons why people don't appreciate coffee because they feel intimidated or they feel yeah, that yeah. there's, it, it can they be. feel intimidated. And, because, and I also would say that because I've learned this, I've been doing this for 26 years. There are many a person who's in the coffee industry and calls them a coffee master. And they've been in coffee for four years. So they're being snobbery, they're being snobbish, not because they are they know everything. 
they're mm-hmm. snobbish because they're insecure. Or yeah. that's how I that's how I read it. So I'm like, no, I'm very confident in who I am. I know what I like. I also know what's good. I also know why I may like a particular coffee over other coffees. But mm-hmm. I'm if, if you if anyone walks into Wyndham's, I want them to feel like they could be coming in drinking instant, or they could be drinking Sudan Rume. It doesn't matter. There's no judgment. I'm here to help you make you a good cup of coffee and hopefully find you something interesting that you will want to buy again and again and again. Yeah, for sure. That's, that's, so our, ethos. When, that's our ethos, I would say that. Yeah. When you were starting off, were there any um, roasteries or no, we're, cafes we're the first. on your level? Ca- so cafes, so Barbados has a lot of hotels and restaurants. There are some small cafes, but it's we're dictated a lot by our tourism industry because Barbados, that's mm-hmm. what we do. So we're... Jamaica has a lot of industrial and commercial businesses. Trinidad, very different. Barbados is a tourism market. The good okay. news is we have a high-end tourism market. The bad news is, or the, the caveat is, is that our tourism is very elderly, is the right word, or is more mature. Mm. So the flavor palette is mature. When I say mature, it's how they want coffee that tastes like coffee. <laughs> so yeah. that's... So we're trying to get someone to try a single origin fruit bomb or a really beautiful, you know, Sudan Rume. That's not what they're in for. They're in for, if anything, yeah. clean chocolate, nut, caramelly, soft coffee. And that's fine too. Okay. So we have that. Yeah. So that's, and that's kind of, we're also, that's led it to us to understand. Um, so we have, so, so a lot of our cafes we have we do have some cafes and some are interesting um, good things but i would definitely say that our market still has a way to go but there mm-hmm. are challenges for that because the market is dictated by the consumer and the consumer is not ready for that yet and so that's where that's where yeah. we stand you know but that's okay i'll i'll I, i'll keep on making the ethiopians for myself <laughs> yeah yeah, you gotta have that thing. Um, so the you're saying the, you're the, the first roaster. Yeah. We are right? the first and only. You're the roaster. first roaster. First so what roaster. What was that reception one? like on an island that didn't have a uh, coffee roaster? It, not not great. That's just the truth. Um, okay. Because uh, people don't seem to understand what we do. As they still don't understand. So that's those are the challenges. Okay. We we are would. One of our biggest challenges is people don't understand or in mass or appreciate what we do. Because a lot of people still consider coffee a commodity. They don't understand that it's something that needs a bit more respect. And I'm not, again, Mm. I'm not trying to say that, oh, it's the most important thing in the world. It's not the most important thing in the world. But made given respect and made well, it can elicit amazing emotions when made bad yeah it could elicit very negative emotions and so that's one of my challenges getting people to appreciate especially my clients which are hotels and restaurants they're like well look we just need to bang out a thousand espressos in an hour i'm like that's almost impossible because you have a one group machine (laughs) so you you need to invest in both the people and the equipment to facilitate an amazing product and that is what mm-hmm. that is, but that's the universal challenge of coffee anywhere, to my knowledge. Yeah. Um, so outside of tourists, when a, a, a local Barbadian comes in mm-hmm. and they're looking for a coffee, what, what is like the typical type of coffees people are getting? Well, it, it, the good news is that there's, there's this. So because of COVID, the most interesting thing about COVID was, is that we had a lot of, uh, what we would call expats, but basically we would have tourists who are be here on a long-term work visa, I meaning they can fly into Barbados, work from Barbados. We have great internet. We had stable. We had a stable way of life per se. There were restrictions, okay. but we had restaurants open. We had cafes open. You just couldn't go party. We would get a lot. We did get a bunch of uh, Western people from North Americans, UK based people flying in, and because of that. They would. They knew coffee, so because they knew coffee, they were coming to me and say, "Hey, I know you're a roaster. Do you have 
X. Let's just say, again, do you sell single origins? Yes, we have a single origins from we have Ethiopian single origins, we have Kenyans, we have a plethora of available coffee, all specialty grade, high end coffee. And they're like, great, let me get some. And then they would say, you know, I would love to try something new. And so because of that, we would then be able to bring in more expensive. So I actually brought in for the first time ever, uh, it was, it's an Ethiopian Sadamo natural process, uh, okay. but it was a cup of excellence national winner. So it was probably about okay. a 90, it was a, it was a 97 point Ethiopian. It cost oh, me, wow. a plus, it was so bloody expensive. First time I've ever bought a coffee that expensive, but it sold because people, yeah. We had people who would appreciate it. And because of that, we we're able then to bring in more expensive coffees and sell them. And then because of that, we had them available. There is some curiosities. So we will have the we will have some people walking and say, I'm happy to try that. And they, and that's the that's the good thing. So they're willing to try. They always go back to what they know, but that's I think that's the human condition. I'm willing to try, mm-hmm. but I can't my brain doesn't appreciate this now. I know I can trust you that it's good because of certain reasons. I'm very knowledgeable. I'm able to provide them lots of information, brew ratios, explain how to brew everything and what's the preferred brew method. Mm-hmm. But then they'll always may always go back to the classic flavor, and that's fine. So we're yeah. we're okay with that. But at the same yeah. time, we do have people who are interested, and part of our since when we started, we always knew we couldn't rely on Barbados. We had mm-hmm. to always, we have, we have, is it, I guess it's an interesting way to put it. As the Caribbean, we have an issue of, a, of respecting our own, meaning mm. we always need external validation, right? Mm. So one of the biggest challenges that we had is when we started roasting coffee and we had, we started off roasting specialty grade, we didn't have anything below 83 to 85 points, you know, and that's okay. so we because we had good coffee, we would roast them well, I would be FedExing samples to fill at least once a month for verification and quality control. And to people that I respected, because again, I've been able to grow uh, a network of people who I can trust to give me real information and to critique me properly. Right. But and they would they were always verify there was they were always verifying to me Dominic you're doing well this is good coffee you may want to look at this but they were they were very positive results but when I would go to my clients especially the ones that had the money to spend they would always be like well no we we don't want this we want the international brand because we can trust that we can't trust you so we okay. knew from the very we knew from a very young t- we knew from the very beginning that if we wanted to be accepted, we couldn't look for validation in Barbados. We had to look for validation externally. And okay. so that's why when we started entering into competitions, so we, and what we did was we entered into UK based competitions because Barbados and the UK share a symbiotic relationship in the sense of we're known as Little Britain sometimes, okay. even though we're now a republic and we now are fully are fully uh, have been removed ourselves from the from the Commonwealth. Sorry, we're still in the Commonwealth, but of the national identity of being part of Britain, we're no longer that. We're now a republic. Right, right. But we started entering competitions in the UK just so that we can get that external validation. And that's mm-hmm. what we did. And the good news is from doing that, for the last four years, we've now won 14 Great Taste Awards. Oh, and this, right. Congratulations. And this is thank you. I mean, it's, it did two things. Because the first one we won was in 2020, the first year of COVID. And if okay. it was, I would definitely say if it wasn't for that first win, we, we may have given up because the challenges. But it did two things. It gave us the, it gave us the recognition that we wanted. Because not mm-hmm. only did we win, we won for a blend. We didn't win for a single origin. We won for a blend, our soup bowl blend. And our soup bowl blend okay. was, is a mixture of some Brazilian and Ethiopian coffees. It's a lot more fruitier than one would expect. And when we won, and I, I, will, I, will, I have to admit, I cried. Because yeah. it was validation from an external source, but it was a validation from a source that is something that I actually believe in. I believe in that when you taste something, if you if you taste it purely on the basis of coffee, 
that's mm-hmm. one thing. But the cool thing about the cool thing about the great taste was is that they had no clue who I was because when I sent up yeah. the, when I sent up the coffees to barcode, the most they know is it's, they know my name. But when they're serving yeah. it, my name is not on it. So to win a reward for something that I created that no, with had no marketing, there was no reason but to to reward us other than because yeah. they said it tasted great. That was that's just a, one of those moments where you're just like. Oh my God, I do know what I'm doing. And yeah, from there, sure. we won that. This, the next year after that, we won, I think we won at least four more Great Taste Awards. And okay. then in 2002, we won more. And we just won three more Great Taste Awards for our coffees. Oh, and wow. there are blends. And that's what makes me excited because, yeah, it's one thing to win on a single origin. But when you win on a blend, that's something that yeah. we have crafted, we have dictated. This is the flavor that we think this should be. And someone says that's great. That's that's that has definitely helped us because now people have people have understood. Well, mm-hmm. if they like it, if they've been validated externally. They must know what they're doing. So we like it now, and that's that's the best part about it. So we get to it's 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 part of our journey. It's never been is easy, that's for sure. But it's something that we know that we've had to do to to take us on that. And it's definitely benefited us, for sure. You, you know, you were talking about when a new customer comes in, you, what you're offering them. Um, yeah. What, one of the things I hear a lot about uh, from, from different cafes throughout the Caribbean is the training process, tr- training our employees. Um, yeah. Do you care to touch a little bit about what that training looks like? Um, training? Well, yeah. uh, I would definitely say I always thought it's a Caribbean thing. But I've come to realize it's a international thing. That's just the truth. You, it's the training part about Barbados is what, and I would say is it's unfair. It's unfair to ask someone to adapt something that's totally alien to everything they've ever known. Most people, right. especially if you're Caribbean, your first taste of coffee is not a pleasant one. Because I mean, has everyone mm-hmm. ever have you ever have you ever had the opportunity to have a coffee to cure your cold have you had that experience yet no not, not no that so one. so so no. definitely the carib especially in barbados right what they would do is they would take instant coffee nescafe or something like that they'll mix it with lime lime juice oh right lime juice and then they'll probably put something else into it and they'll tell you to drink it as a cure for your cold all right now are we talking like the imagine- super sour limes Super sour limes that you get in the yeah, Caribbean. No yeah, sweet like, limes. Oh, there's there's yes. no sugar in this. But imagine no. taking that as a child. So yeah, coffee to I you could. is this gross, nasty, horrible, bitter, sour coffee flavor. There's no way you're going to experience coffee, I say, in a European would. And where in a European yeah. way, coffee, or especially in Barbados, in, in, the, in Europe, I would imagine... Your first cup of coffee is going to the coffee bar to see your dad or your mom drinking an espresso going, oh, that's that's a completely different aspect versus yeah. take this, drink it, it may, it may cure your cold and it tastes terrible. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then it's also an alien culture because especially in Barbados, we don't, we don't drink coffee in Barbados. We wear tea. We're okay. tea. Where other Caribbean islands, they grow coffee, but even then, I would say what the locals drink is not the good stuff. They always get the bad stuff. Even, and that's yeah. something that's 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 specific to any coffee growing country. So it's not mm-hmm. Caribbean only. So it's hard for someone who to take on an alien process. So that's something yeah, that I've had to learn. Point. I've had to learn to maybe review. It's taken me a long time, but I have to review and come to where they're coming from mm-hmm. and bring them up. So that's why now you would say that we, we do a lot more because of sensory training. And, and I, I'm not a Q grader, but I have done, we just before COVID, I did pre-Q. So mm-hmm. on sensory and tasting, we have to find a way to utilize flavors that are Caribbean specific and mm-hmm. try to make them understand this is what coffee can taste like. Yeah. And the, cool, and the good news is there are those who want to learn but then there are also those who don't want to learn. And that's why yeah. that will always be the challenge. The difference being is there, because we come from a small pot, 
there are very few people who want to learn versus, say, when you have the United States, what, 350 million people? And coffee right. is part of their culture. It is easier yeah. for them to understand versus where coffee is not part of the culture. So that's why mm -hmm. we've had to adapt our training to get them to that. I would also say, to, and it's not, when I meet someone, the diamonds in the rough, I'm willing to give them all the information that I can. And we do. Yeah. I mean, we, ha we have an online, bar online barista training course through Barista Hustle, and we give okay. it away for free. If, you, if you're interested, here's this. It's online. If you're a cafe client, we want, you to, we want you to learn, and we're happy to give information. And this is the truth. There's so much information on YouTube, but the only problem with YouTube is that there's a lot of bad information. And that's something yeah. that, that's where I, that's what I actually spend a lot more time countering. The, the, the bad information because people don't seem to understand if it's on YouTube, it must be real. No, that's, mm -hmm. that's where we have to say no or understanding the context or the historical context of why in, a, in Italian espresso, you use seven grams for a single espresso and 18 to 14, 14 to 18 grams in specialty. And I would definitely yeah. say there are a lot of Western based coffee professionals who actually don't understand that. And that's why mm -hmm. I have a lot more, I use a lot of historical reference when training okay. people. So that's, that's definitely what I would say where I come from at. I'm loath to blame the people at the lowest bottom of the, of the pole for not being able to achieve something when there are more people with more skill and maybe education who themselves don't know the information and expect someone below them to know it more than that. Yeah. That, that's the absolute fantastic part. I think I'll just take the snippet of what you just said there for a little bit, and that's going to just be its own. Uh, because <laughs> understanding that context of where they're coming from and then coaching them up and understanding the difference of their motivation. That yeah. Some are going to be motivated to want to take this as far as possible to upskill. Yeah. You know, I talk, talk to some clients and I'm like, you know, you can think of this uh, as an opportunity to motivate them that they can use this skill wherever they go. Right. Yes. So if they go off to college, they can have this skill yeah. or this might be just a one stop for this person. But you got to figure out how you're going to optimize that. So that's that they bring the best to your product. And that's yeah. OK that they are going to just make a pit stop at you. Right. Yeah, uh, I think I think I think it's also though it's it's, you know, it's kind of like riding a bike, though, or learning to play mm -hmm. the piano. Being able to make good coffee will benefit you for the rest of your life. <laughs> so yeah. the simple fact is, so while it may be purely it doesn't have to be a profession but when you're at home and you have invested say in just a good bag of coffee mm -hmm. you should know how to make it or make it the mm -hmm. way that you want you should know as a consumer how you to taste therefore yeah. it's it's easier for you to find what you like and versus spending a lot of money on a lot of useless tools that will never make your coffee better because ultimately the coffee you're buying yeah. is not what you actually want. And that's like why I mm -hmm. use a lot of food metaphors again. I use constantly use food metaphors to explain to people, well, what do you want to taste? And they're like, well, I want coffee. I'm like, great. So chocolate, not sweet. Great. Then you want this. Oh, okay. Yeah. But do you, and that's, that's because again, that's how we break it down to them. It's what is it that you want to taste, not what I yeah. want you to taste. What do you want to taste? And mm -hmm. then, t then we can then say to them, okay, like so. Our most classic thing is our Dawn Patrol. Dawn Patrol is our quintessential, what we what I would classify a modernized Italian espresso. It follows the Italian espresso recipe: Brazil, a Central American, and a. Asian varietal of some sort, purely based off of availability and crop and crop. But let's just say it. it's roasted. Each component is roasted to provide a classic. Because we also do, I don't do uh, post roast mixing. I we roast every component individually to bring out the best flavor, and then blend to bring out the best flavors for us. Right. So what right. we so. But each individual component, like say Sumatra, I know Sumatra can be a bad word to some people, but a great tasting clean Sumatra can add oh, yeah. the it can add the 
the fresh earthiness, earthiness and the herbaceous flavor that can be found in Italian espresso, but minus mm-hmm. the dirt or the ashiness. And yeah. so that if you use that component, and, and it can be medium roasted, it doesn't have to be dark roasted, you mm-hmm. then pair that with a very sweet Brazilian and a lovely rounding Guatemalan, per se, or a Colombian. Yeah. This brings out a cleaner flavor than just a dark roasted Italian coffee. So if we so we sell, I will definitely say we sell a lot of Dom Patrol, and I put a little bit of robusta in it, but we put robusta in it purely for the caffeine content because it's Dom Patrol. Okay. We want to wake up early, but that those flavors are clean. We then move on to other blends, like say our soup bowl and our even our duppies. They are a lot of the same coffees are being used. They're just being utilized a little different, which brings okay. out different flavors, which then elicits a slight a transition from what they know to what they don't know. But it then mm-hmm. but it's easy enough for them to try to transition through it so that they can then go on to our single origins. And we have core single origins and our single origins, I like to, I, I, I use a lot of duality, I guess is the right word for it, and historical context. There's no sense giving someone like our Ethiopian wish-wash, natural experimental or anaerobic process, natural process. It is a okay. fruit bomb, fruit bomb. There's no sense me yeah. giving that to someone because yeah. they're, they're not going to like it. It's not what they expect. But if mm-hmm. I can transition them from Dawn Patrol to say a just a, a, a typical core natural process Sadamo, Ethiopia Sadamo, yeah. where it has a lot more chocolate, but there is a fruitiness aspect to it, I can then take them from the most classic of roast to then whoosh whoosh over a period over a year. And and then they transition and they eventually do like to taste it. They always go back to Dawn Patrol, but they do like the fact that they can keep on trying something new. And that's why we're always bringing in something new. We're always yeah. looking for something that's good, that's new, but also consistent. If you're mm. unable to provide a consistency, you, you're going to, I think it's, it's a core tenant, I believe, in any roaster is to be able to provide mm-hmm. consistency. If you're not consistent, yeah. you're not going to be able to create a long cut, a long, you're not going to be able to, to foster a great customer base that's going to stay with you for long. Yeah. So uh, to, to build that consistency, what does your sourcing look like being a, a Southern Caribbean island? So what, how are you yeah. acquiring so, these green so, beans? So we you so, going out yourself and your catamaran no, and I I, I, so, I wish I wish I wish I could tell you how that's where the one thing okay so I get a lot of questions so do you just fly over to Origin and I'm like I could barely afford like a plane ticket from Barbados yeah. just to the United States is almost thousands of dollars for me to right. get it's actually here's the interesting thing most importantly the Caribbean is I can't get to the Caribbean island. For less than a thousand US dollars. And they're twenty minutes away. Like Grenada, as you said, you're you were based or based. I can't yeah, get to Grenada yeah. for less than a thousand US dollars. Right? I can right. fly to New York. Go all the way up for to cheaper. Miami and I go to Miami down. and back down, right? So to get to never, South America, <laughs> Central America or yeah. South America, it's ridiculous. So that's something that we've come to use to. So the good news is the reality is that we spend a lot of money with FedEx and DHL getting samples from reputable, reputable um, suppliers and who know what we're looking for, who know who our spec are is, and will work with us to get us to our coffee. Because, yeah, logistically, it's not a, it's not a piece of cake. Let's just say that. Yeah. Let's just say one, Did- a, de- a day's delay in shipping could mean no coffee for a month. <laughs> Let's just say okay. that. <laughs> so what, what is the typical average? Like, so you place your order um, today. When so, would you so expect we, it we, to we, arrive? We, we, so when our, our, our current way of sourcing is we find coffees. We would go to, depending on the need. So we have established suppliers, say for Brazil. We don't need to get, we don't need to go buy a thousand different Brazils. We get a great high quality um, 83 to 84 point Brazil from one of our suppliers. We, we buy a lot, we'll, we do a lot of cuppings, we'll send us samples, and we'll buy a lot, and we'll buy the whole lot. So depending on okay. the size, that could be anywhere between 50 to 200 bags. 
for okay. us, 60 kilogram bags. We'll put it on contract and they'll hold it for us. We will then pull, we'll tip, we'll pull down from that as need be. When we're looking for something really special, we may go direct to a farm. So we've, we've built up contacts from around the world, go from a particular farmer, a single lot, maybe a micro lot. We have those abilities. We would do the same thing. We'll, we'll cut, okay. buy, hold it, bring in as we need to fit, um, and go from there. The bigger issues is your logistics. Let's just say we ha- we had you know we we are in the hurricane belt. <laughs> so yeah. if um, if Florida gets hit <laughs> or New York and the increasing New York, Texas, hell, yeah. there's a cal- yeah. a hurricane in California. Right. You know, yeah. a week ago. That stuff messes with logistics. So one day late can lead to no coffee for a month. And that's where we are. That we have to be that we are very on top of things. And we're always looking and we're always searching. And we have to be very good at what we do to get our coffee to us. But we have a, after 26 years in the game, we know a, a thing or two. So we're able to manage expectations and able to do it to what we're, we do. We do what we have to do to ensure our clients get what they need. Let's just say that. Okay. I have been, yeah. I have been partial to FedExing large amounts of coffee in by air freight just to make sure my clients are happy. <laughs> yeah, there's that. gotta be some legit clients, Dominic, cause <laughs> just to send a letter. I, cause I, cause I have to be better than everyone else. That's yeah. I, I, it's part of the consistency thing. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't, I can't be as good as what my customer, my client, I have to be better than anyone in the world okay. because that's the only way I can prove myself that I'm, that we are worthy of business. And that's what, mm. that's important to us. I can't, I would say for anyone, you can't, because the bar is quite low, mm. I can't be just as good as what is else available in say Florida or Got Barbados. It. There's no one around Barbados that does it, but anyone can go on Amazon and buy any coffee. So I have to right. be better than that. I have to be able to say, can I get you coffee within a day? Yes, that's me. Mm. Do you wish? And that's why we have like one of our, because you were asking us about COVID earlier. One of the things that we did have from the very beginning, we've always been a progressive company. Um, we've been a progressive company from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. We have certain values that are important to us that we will not sacrifice. Those are consistency. Uh, consideration of our clients, of, of our everyone, consideration of who's around us, our clients, our staff, our community. We have to be considerate to understand what their needs are because they're the ones, they're the ones giving us money. They're the ones paying hmm. us for what we're doing. They do have, Barbados does have the ability to FedEx in anything. Anyone can buy, because we don't uh, buy, we buy a lot of foreign products. We're not like Trinidad and Jamaica or other islands that have the ability to grow things. We're not, the, we're not mm-hmm. that size. So we do import a lot. So I have to consider that anyone could buy any product. If they're mm. going to choose mine, it has to be better than any product that they can get internationally. And that's something mm. that we work very hard on to achieve. Yeah. Now that's a good, that's a good why and uh, values to keep, keep everybody going and, you know, especially yeah. when you ever encounter those tough times. So yeah, in, in this say. particular section about Wyndham's, Dominic, I know you guys have a very special, uh, I will use the word initiative, but um, can you talk more about Cane Dog? Sure, Cane Dog. So Cane Dog came about, I guess, because of part of our values, part of our cores. Like Barbados is our home, right? We're a, we're and I'm, I'm not, don't use the word foreigner, but let's just say when someone, an expat, someone who is not born here and may mm-hmm. not, is not going to, I may not choose to live here indefinitely, right. may not view Barbados and certain things and certain ways of being as important. Mm. Right. Because Barbados is my home and because I want Barbados to be the best, we have to address both the negatives and the positives. 
The negatives are, as a small island, we do have an issue with animal cruelty. And mm. that's, that's the negative. With the positive is that we have the ability to do something about it. So Wyndham's, we created, when we, Mandy and I created Wyndham's, Wyndham's is geared towards creating flavorsome coffees that are progressive, are beyond what's normal, and at the same mm -hmm. time, showcasing Barbados in a particular way. And okay. that's, what, that's what Wyndham's are. But as we know, there are those who do not want to spend forever making a single origin or taste fruity notes in their coffee. They want coffee that tastes like coffee. So mm. we decided when we needed to create something that was more simpler in palate, I guess, in a way, or more classic in flavor, we just didn't want to just do it without a reason. And so Mandy, my wife, is a dog lover and an animal lover. And quite honestly, she got tired. She got tired of talking to people with more money, talking to people who are more have more abilities to do something about animal cruelty. And there's a lot of talk. And she said, yeah. she said she's done with that. She's going to put her mm. money where her mouth is. And so she created Cane Dog. And Cane Dog's mission is to eradicate animal cruelty in Barbados. Now, how are we going to do that? We donate 10% of all proceeds of Cane Dog to animal welfare projects in Barbados. Now, the great thing about Cane Dog, okay. Cane Dog is a, is a flavor, profile, flavor profile for those who want classic flavors. Roasty, toasty okay. flavors that are classic. So it doesn't harm Wyndham's. It actually helps Wyndham's because Wyndham's gets to... If you want Wyndham's, it's because you want, to, you want to push the boundaries of what coffee should be. Cane Dog mm -hmm. is for those who just want that classic flavor. So in doing so, we created the Cane Dog brand, and it's and here's the thing. So I don't know what you may, when Grenada you will call it, but every island has a name for their strays. So I don't know what in Grenada hmm. they call it, but in certain, every island they have a particular way. So in yeah. Barbados, a Cane Dog is basically a mutt. It's a pot hound. But here's another word for it. It's their blends. So when you take yeah. a blend... You're all taking right. all these disparate elements or these elements that on their own have no unique character. But when you blend okay. them together, they create the most loving, soul-satisfying thing in the world. And that's what we that's what we cane dogs are. Cane dogs are dogs that yeah. are born in the in the cane fields of Barbados. They're loving and they just want to be given a good home, but they're loyal and they're consistent. And that's the way they are. Yeah. So Cane Dog was born of that. And that's the coolest thing. So we created Cane Dog and we then we and we're very proud of Cane Dog because of that. We've donated the, last year we donated up to twelve thousand Barbados dollars. That's like six thousand oh, US dollars wow. to an animal welfare cause in Barbados. And because of that, we're able to then get more recognition for the hard work that these people are going through. Yeah. And yeah, it's just yeah. a way of something that we can grow and we could definitely say as a side to what we're doing it is a completely mm -hmm. different brand that has the ability to grow and without affecting Wyndham's and we're very proud of that so we went from yeah. Cane Dog Dark Roast to then Cane Dog Organic I would let, uh, like, to, like to point out that both Cane Dog Organic and Cane Dog uh, Espresso have both won great taste awards and okay. we're very proud of that um but we're also about to launch a product called Cane Dog, our first single origin, Cane Dog okay. Columbia. And Cane Dog Columbia is going to be a special uh, single origin because we're not just using any coffee. We're using a coffee. We, we went to Columbia in 2022. We met a great team of people who, are, who believe in the same thing as animals as us. Okay. And so they, as farmers... And as exporters will donate part of their proceeds to animal welfare projects in Colombia and are okay. doing so. And we, when Windows and through Cane Dog, when we sell Cane Dog Colombia, we mm -hmm. will donate, keep on donating 10% of our proceeds here. And so it just now becomes a more, instead of it just being a localized uh, yeah. treatment or a localized, what's the right word? Sorry. I'm really bad with PR. My PR people are going to hate me. You're going to edit all this out. Um, a localized solution 
we now get a regional mm-hmm. solution. So we're not yeah. just not only in Barbados, yeah. but now Colombia. So if we can now grow this to be bigger and bigger, we do feel that we can address these issues to benefit Barbados, to help Barbados grow and be better. Because there's nothing mm-hmm. wrong with saying you're not perfect. No one's perfect. Right. But if you address a problem properly, it leads to more positive experiences. And that's mm. kind of our, that's part of what we try to kind of do. So that's Cane Dog. So we're very proud of that. And we're, we're happy to grow it and get bigger and bigger and bigger and do more with it as the time comes. Yeah. And, and it is amazing work. Yeah. And I think those who are listening, the audience who is from the Caribbean, understand that relationship with the dogs. People who sure. visit, they might be shocked at first. Um, but like you're describing the characteristics of these dogs, yeah. uh, it, it is amazing. Yeah, and the blend of them it, it is super special. It um, is. They are and loving and they're beautiful. So many... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're, it's, just, and, it's just one of those things. It's feel good. So it, it's, it's, it's the best part about it is that we can do it. And I will be honest, there are people who are like saying, why would you give away your money? And I'm saying, because if it's going to benefit my island and it's going to benefit yeah. something that I love, my, I mean, I wasn't a dog lover. I was not. I mm. liked dogs, but I'm not yeah. a dog lover. But I've come to realize that, that dogs and animals, they're, they're amazing things, you know? Yeah. Speak to a dog person and they know why dogs are important. And so once you come to realize that, they give so much love and they get so little. They give so much and ask for so much in, for, in return. The least you can do is just give them that little bit of love. They're, yeah, they're, yeah. So, so that's the sense. I've become definitely a dog lover. And I would definitely say it's, it helps benefit the island because an island mm-hmm. that can learn from its mistakes and learn and course correct is an mm-hmm. island on the way for better things. An island yeah. that's not able to recognize your problems that are intrinsic in the way you are and change is an island destined, destined to be relegated and eventually fail. So that's, yeah. that's how I feel about it. Yeah. And, and I, th- I think it goes to the idea of what a business looks like in our time period now that you can have a business for yourself but that businesses also have different initiatives that make the world a better place. And it I sounds think, like cane I mean, dogs help do that for, for the, the dogs of the community. I would definitely say so. No, it's, it's not, and I would definitely say, I don't say it's easy. As I said, it's not easy. No. It's especially hard because it's the one thing that people don't seem to understand about businesses in the Caribbean is that it is Four times or five times, look, it's a hundred times harder to do anything in, in the Caribbean than it is in anywhere else. As I said, yeah. the ability to, the, the access to everything is, is so much easier in the Western world. Mm-hmm. The, in, in say if you're in, the, if you're in the US or the UK or in Europe and all that, even in, even in say, if you're in the bigger cities in South America, you know, in that respect, the, but because I've been doing it long enough, I know that we can do things in a particular way that can benefit my island home. And that's, it's something that I want to do because I also yeah. recognize the benefit it brings me. And it brings me, boy, I have a, I have a clear, I have a better, I, I sleep better at night, I guess you could say, because I'm not mm. an asshole. I will say that. <laughs> it, and then it's yeah. also it's just, it's just because you come up from a small island, we know what is interesting about being in a Caribbean island, maybe not in the bigger island because they're too big, but in Barbados, every, everyone's connected in some way, even though while we're, that we're not, it, leads, it can lead to more positives when you're nice to someone than if you're negative. Now, you, I'm not, yeah. trust me, I can't be nice to everyone. But if you treat your neighbors well and you treat people around you well, and look, I'm coming to the Caribbean. I have beaches. I have surf. I have sunshine 365 days a year. You know, I could pick a mango off a tree. I have yeah. things a lot better than most. Why be negative? And that's, I think that positivity yeah. thing 
is part of it, the positivity that you can have. You know, we have these great things to have. Where I live in paradise. There are a lot mm -hmm. of negatives, but I do live in paradise. So therefore, I if you take that and put and put remember that every morning when you wake up and I see the sun mm -hmm. rising and when they go walking through a cane field and it's beautiful and it's quiet and I can hear the birds singing and everything. I should try and translate that into my daily life. And that's kind of like what we do. Yeah. And that's kind of like what we do. So like well, our tagline, Beijing Days Ahead. It's a tagline not just to say Barbados is great, but it's a Bajan day is a great day. So I hope you mm -hmm. and wish you a Bajan day ahead. And so because I'm very okay. happy and proud of I'm very proud of my home in that respect. Because in Barbados, yeah. you know, we're a little we're, we're not the most uh we're not party as much party animals as, as other Caribbean islands, but we're friendly. Mm -hmm. We're every every Bajan wants to be, wants to lend a hand, and we have mm -hmm. community. So that's that's kind of the Bajan spirit, and I kind of want to translate that to yeah. what I do yeah. it every day. Thank you for listening, and we hope you've enjoyed this coffee story from the Caribbean. This was the first part of a two part episode with Dominic Wyndham Giddings of Wyndham's Bayesian Coffee Roasters out of Barbados. Click the link in the description of this video for part two. Follow us on this journey of Caribbean coffee stories. Click that subscribe button to see more of the coffee stories of the Caribbean. Give it a thumbs up if you enjoyed and engage with us in the comments. You can listen to this podcast on YouTube podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at Caribbean Coffee Collective and also on LinkedIn at Caribbean Coffee Collective Podcast. Thank you, and as always, be brilliant.